Welcome everybody, uh, and uh, yeah, also thanks to to the organizers for for wow well, doing this all uh, this effort to to keep the community going, and I think it's very important. And uh, I will um, talk about today about resonance detected 2D spectroscopy of coupled chromophores. force. Actually, it's uh, well you will see it's partly a journey through history, but but I hope I won't bore you too much because uh, it's going to be. Or, or we are at the point where, where we just open new avenues uh, well, where it has, has been a long story before. But what I'm going to talk about, actually, OK, here we go. So it's about this uh, light harvesting complex two of uh, purple bacteria. All right, so you have like a, 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 a real view here and then like a zooming in and to uh, see how this is all organized. So you have this in this. Uh, membrane, LH1, LH2, a reaction center, light comes, or triggers uh, um, like here, energy harvesting uh, and uh, uh, like uh, charge separation of reaction center and so on. And uh, all this I want to talk about, but uh, rather about this initial process of light harvesting. And as you will see in the very end, I will talk really about the very initial process of what happens if a photon is absorbed, or what the photon uh, sees are, are from this uh, uh, complex. All right, so here's a more uh, uh, kind of real life uh, picture of the one that's from the work of Carl Schulden. And you see here how this is organized. So essentially you have like a, a individual multi-chromophoric systems in this membrane. And then here you have like the LH, I mean, these are the LH2s, and then you have the LH1 and the reaction center here in the middle. Okay, so I will talk about this LH2. And uh, when I got into this, this was about the time uh, when the first high resolution structures appear. Uh, here's from that original paper, which has been cited a lot by, the, by now. And you see, okay, well, here you have uh, two types of uh, chromophores, which are normally labeled according to their Absorption maxima is a B800 and B850. Right? So here you see an absorption spectrum. You have this band B850, B800. Uh, well, you see there's some more into this figure, and I will come to this in a second. All right. So what's interesting about these systems? Well, let's first uh, look at uh, maybe more kind of traditional view. Uh, okay, if you talk about energy transfer, or you immediately think about uh, first set transfer. All right, so if I look at this uh, kind of coupled chromophores, I have like LH2s here, LH1. So you have like different processes, different pigment pools, which have a distinct coupling. And uh, while related to this are certain time scales, like so time scales for transfer between this B800, B800 uh, pigments are uh, 800 to 850, and intra well, 850 and transfer, and then also between the complexes, and you see like all numbers. I'm sensing a range of ranging from a few hundred femtosecond <coughs> to uh, some tens of uh, picosecond, the longest process probably like you go here to the reaction set. Okay, if you would describe this by first set transfer, here's the first rate. And as you're all uh, familiar with, that's essentially the overlap integral between the donor acceptance, uh, donor emission and the absorption of the acceptor. Okay, before really being so brave to, to really describe all this refer first, uh, one should kind of just have a second thought because like these pigments here will be strongly coupled and we have very short time scales. And this should uh, ring the bell already because if you then think about, okay, what's, what's at the heart of this First, the transfer, it's essentially kind of time scale separation between transfer and local equilibration. All right, so the process is like you excite the donor, it relaxes due to uh, exciton vibration interaction, emits, and only then you transfer. So you start from an equilibrium situation here, and there's, well, most notably, like no kind of coherence, it's a completely incoherent process. All right, so is this true for all these processes? Of course not, otherwise I won't, wouldn't talk about this. All right, so here, um, 
what's known from, from ORI from the old days. So LH2 spectroscopy is say take like the strongly coupled uh, pigment pool like this B850 pigments. All right, so you see here again, like a, a, see where we stripped off all uh, uh, protein and carotenoids. So you see here like this uh, 850 ring and the 800 ring. Um, these were some calculations back then uh, when I was a postdoc. So I mean, well, what you see here is a transient absorption spectrum of this B850 part. And you see like very rapid relaxation of and uh, this was in the right ballpark, like a few hundred fantasy. Like the different curves are different models, but that's, that's not really important. Okay, so having this uh, agreement of, with the experiment, we kind of said, okay, well, there, there it cannot be first, of course, and there must be some sort of uh, uh, delocalization. But then if you think about it, you initially excite a kind of wave packet, a superposition state of excitonic states. And which then relaxes and uh, also decoheres, and you get uh, uh, kind of, um, if you want, dynamical uh, localization, which back then we just expressed in terms of uh, the exciton density matrix. So just, okay, here's a side index, it's time, that would be kind of this quantity uh, in case where it's completely coherent. So basically, you have like all the wave packet extends over the whole uh, ring. Or when you include like disorder effects as it's done in the simulation, you get like some initial delocalization, then a rapid localization, and you get some average coherence in it. So there's uh, apparently strong coupling between the common force, which kind of outcompetes um, the exciton vibrational coupling. Looking at the 800, uh, we also did this just look at the 800 complex. Uh, that's uh, then you have like two processes at the same time, you have intraband processes between 800 pigments and then 800 to 850 population flow. And that's what you see here while it's excitation in the 800 range, it depopulates and then excites uh, or then have population transfer to the 850s. Okay, if you look at in more detail to this, uh, here on the left and the right hand side, you see kind of just traces on this compared to experimental data and uh, from the Wilsonson group. And uh, yeah, this was uh, done with, or this like the full simulation. This was the simulation here on the left were done with a, a model where you, where the B850 pigments just act as a kind of trap. So you have no coherence. It's just like some incoherent energy flow into the B850s. I you see like, uh, okay, if you do this, you can fit your data to one wavelength, but at the, at the other, other, at some other wavelength, then it's, you get some disagreement. And the way this was inter interpreted was that, okay, there's some sort of uh, important role for like uh, of the, this kind of here, you see here over here, upper exciton states, uh, which kind of mix with this B850 pigments uh, and it's sort of, I mean, you might, might call this hybridization which then leads to some effect like, okay, so you have intrabond processes, but you also have kind of, if you want to see this in a, in a more local picture, you've got some detour mechanisms via these 850s. All right, so um, uh, more recently, we looked at this in terms of, I mean, okay, well, theory developed. And uh, so nowadays it's possible to really do a very high dimensional simulation of the Schrödinger equation for a coupled are vibrations and excitations. And okay, that's this, this sort of model, or it was still too big. So we, in order to really take lots of vibrational degrees of freedom into account, we had to cut it to a non-amer. Non so it's not really capturing all the features, but as you will see, some important aspects are covered. These are, um, that's a model from uh, uh, that paper where you have essentially like B850 and B850 alpha and beta, so which have different energies. So what you see here, like this three, six, nine or so are the 800 pigments. So they're kind of coupled. And then the 850s are kind of split off in, in this kind of uh, double band uh, fashion. 
All right. Um, so how to treat this? Okay, that's the spectral density from, from this uh, uh, source here, experimental data, which has been decomposed in the phonon wing and in the vibrational contributions. And uh, with this, we now started basically discretizing the phonon wing, discretizing these vibrations. So in, in fact, you had, there were like 26 uh, modes per monomer. And if you take this nine electronic states, you had like 200 something vibrational modes. And for this model, we then solve the Schrodinger equation uh, in 230 dimensions with uh, nine states, which is, of course, only possible using some uh, tricks. And the tricks, trick is this multi-layer, multi configuration time-dependent hardware method, which uh, is developed in, in Heidelberg by the group of Hans Dieter Meyer. And it works in a way, while well, you see the ansatz here, that uh, you're not I mean, like standard quantum mechanics, you would take a basis and then have some coefficient, which say, how, I mean, like how or any of these products contributes to the moving wave packet. Here, you also put the basis functions time dependent. And with this, you get a really compact representation. And you can do really like simulations with thousands of degrees of freedom. OK, so what do we get from that? So that's a simulation where you start with 800 and then just watch uh, the population flow, right? So that's the excited 800, or you, you kind of transfer this. So there's some sort of quantum beating between the excited and non-excited so, uh, um, 800. Uh, so what essentially tells you that the excitation delocalizes in this B800. So it's not, I mean, really kind of hopping like transport. Uh, you also can figure out what's the effect of these vibrations. Okay, and that's, that's, this here is like a full simulation. Here you all, we only took into account vibrations, here only phonons. And you see it's non-additive. So basically phonons um, on the one hand influence the B800, B800 transfer port. All right, so if you, you see like this beating pattern is completely different. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they also influence by um, uh, the transport to the B850, B850, so you like see here B850 is growing in, it's growing here in here much slower. So it's like some oh, resonance effects and, and so on playing a role. Okay, well, so this just tells you, okay, it's all kind of uh, uh, coupled and you have a delocalized wave packet. You can quantify this uh, by just uh, calculating or the reduced exciton density matrix doing some time average here. Uh, you get this type of uh, figure. So the diagonal are just the populations of the different sites. So this is like, or uh, the uh, large uh, amplitudes here are the uh, excited to 800. So you get like this one, that one, that one. You see also there's some coherence between uh, 800 and 800. So this is like these peaks here. But on the other hand, you also see like uh, 800 uh, mixes uh, with 850, so that's that's like these smaller uh, dots here. So it's also you have coherences uh, between, say, for instance, the 800 uh, and B850 uh, beta uh, pigments. All right. So, uh, but it's all about two-dimensional spectroscopy. That's uh, the, the name of this uh, uh, lecture series. So I have to uh, also put some more recent data and uh, this. Uh, uh, essentially data from uh, Donatas Sigmantas lab and I, I saw him on, on, the, on the speaker list so he will probably tell more about this later. So I will just put this into context. So there has been some, some recent uh, 2D photon echo spectroscopy work and uh, analyzing also oh, here, oh, you have the spectrum here, it's now in wave numbers. So it's just have to rethink this because uh, I gave it in, in, in uh, wave lengths before. Uh, and then you see here like the time evolution of the spectrum. So you can, uh, if you look, for instance, here at the 800 peak, you see some evolution, which is, or well, if you analyze this closer, and that's probably what he will tell about, um, it's, uh, uh, you have some non-uniform spectral diffusion. You can differentiate between some very really rapid 300 femtosecond 800, 800 transfer time scale, uh, and to also uh, see in com uh, competition with that, you had, 800, 850 time scale, one picosecond, which is about what we observed in that uh, earlier work. 
I don't know, on, on the other hand, like looking at this peak here, which is due to the 850 on its spectral uh, evolution, you see some very rapid interbrand relaxation. And uh, he will probably tell you that the depolarization dynamics is very interesting of this uh, um, band, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, non-uniform. And, and uh, this will be um, uh, most likely explained uh, later on in, in, in this, or just check this paper because that's not the actual point of my talk here. Okay, so there, there are data on that, which is uh, like a more modern view as compared to this old transient absorption spectra, but lots of feature like this BA tunnel, BA tunnel 50 mixing showing up also in this more advanced uh, technique. The other complexes, I mean, just to play on that uh, game because uh, on uh, this, for instance, this Vinosum uh, um, complex, and that's kind of interesting here. It's also 2D data from uh, Donatas and uh, uh, Marco Schröter, who was a student uh, 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 doing actually experiment and theory. And um, here you see why this complex is interesting. It has a kind of split 800 band. Well, and there's some uh, in the Kühler group, some uh, has been some investigation of the split band. And they suggest a, a structure where you have like different B800 uh, complexes, which have like, as you see here, like a different position with respect to this B850 complexes. Okay, and if you analyze this, you find, okay, well, this, or at least from this 2D analysis, so it's basically following this peak here, uh, well, you see it's kind of growing in. So you get different time scales, which are uh, kind of shown here in more detail. Uh, for the intrabond dynamics between 800 blue, 800 red, and from the relaxation down to the B850. Right, so it's kind of, I'm not, I mean, there's been some speculation, could this be just like different complexes which you measure, uh, or are they kind of coherently coupled? And, and in fact, it's, it's kind of, they are, they are coupled. We did some simulation for that. And uh, while well, there has been no, I mean, it has been just a preliminary model of the geometry, which you see here uh, in top again, well, it was on the previous slide, uh, in a more global picture. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, Kühler group. And um, okay, so then if you start doing a simulation of the absorption spectrum, which is shown down here compared to experiment, assuming that all uh, uh, side energies are equal, okay, it doesn't, look too bad, but it also doesn't fit. So we need to do, we did some sort of uh, refitting of the spectra, like for instance, assuming that the B800Bs are like shifted downwards, okay, it gets better. But from here to here, we, we uh, changed, I mean, parameters of the relaxation and dephasing model, just the pure dephasing strengths, still not perfect. Uh, and a kind of perfect agreement you only get when you also uh, change the uh, 800, 850 coupling uh, from the I mean, values you get from the type approximation. So that they have to be a bit larger and then you get kind of fair good, fairly good agreement. Okay, question is what's behind that? And that's in this, uh, 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 this uh, figure here, while well, here you see like the decomposition of the ion states into contributions from 850, 800A and 800B and the, the uh, Carrots here are the absorption os or the oscillator strength. All you see here is the B850 band, and you see, okay, for the original model, it's it's kind of fairly bad a comparison. Like you get like two peaks which are not of equal strength. So then you have this model with the different uh, uh, side energies. Okay, it's getting better, and the best agreement you get down here. And what you see here is that the different peaks of the blue and red uh, pigments here quite mixed uh, character between uh, 800A, 800B, and 850. All right, so the notion that it's all kind of pure 800 state, 850 states, and you have some, probably some first transfer, it's, it's, uh, it's not very uh, realistic. You can also look at the time scales. All right, so you have this kind of quantum mass equation simulation. Uh, here's like the population flow, exciting uh, 800B, exciting 800 of blue or 800 uh, red excitation. And you watch the population flow integrating this up, you get like this picture, uh, which then can be analyzed with some sort of rate fitting. And well, I mean, in, in a way we, we, have, you, we have designed this model to, to fit this, that to fit these timescales observed in this 2D data 
together with the absorption spectra. And so it's no surprise that we get pretty close. Also, in a sense, okay, you have a situation where you have some intra V800 band dynamics. And uh, on top of it, you have a rapid interband dynamics. And uh, this all comes about well, in a very kind of subtle balance of uh, localization, delocalization of the associated uh, states. All right, now comes the actual topic I wanted to talk about. Uh, and that's, uh, let's first go back to this uh, a, um, uh, LH2 as acidophila uh, data. And uh, uh, okay, so I mean, if I think about it, okay, well, I said, okay, we, we have this coupling, strong coupling between 800 and 850. Shouldn't it show up somewhere here in this cross peak region? Also, in, the, in this kind of traditional notion, you have like a common ground state, and then, then you, you excite uh, uh, also here, or you see features here in, in this uh, uh, cross peak region. Well, of course, it does not because you, I mean, first of all, you cannot go for technical reasons to down to zero femtosecond here. And in addition, on that side, as you, well, this audience is uh, certainly familiar with this, you get like a super imposed contributions from uh, grass deep bleach simulated emission and excited state absorption. Well, you can do differently uh, uh, and uh, use fluorescence detector to the spectroscopy. Uh, that's the setup which uh, from the Lund lab uh, of chemical polaroids. And while well, it's essentially giving you, well, also uh, like, uh, okay, so it's basically like a four parts uh, uh, experiment and it's kind of, if you call it, you can call it action detected through the spectra. And this sort of singling out of a certain uh, leeable space path you do to just by phase uh, cycling. Also at the very end, you have like a different, you can assign uh, different uh, features here to different sort of uh, uh, excitation paths and uh, just have a different experiment because you don't measure like a field, a single field by but the uh, intensity of fluorescence. Uh, I'm not an experimentalist, um, so I don't want to go to, into this in detail. So if you do this and be at population time zero, uh, then you see, okay, well, uh, before you had this basically with this photon echo like setup, and now you get this signal where you have a very strong uh, cross peak. Right? And this is before any population transfer happened, and it's clearly visible. And of course, uh, meanwhile, and, and also back then, uh, simultaneously, this has been investigated also by others. So it's not a feature of that experiment. So that's kind of error that we want uh, approved also in other labs, uh, by the way, also by our. Uh, simulated by our, our host. Okay, how you get this? I mean, why, why, why this is different now? So in order to, to make this, um, uh, to figure out why you all of a sudden see this cross peak, one has to analyze what's actually measured in this fully detected uh, uh, to this spectroscopy. You can do this, uh, of course, using perturbation theory, but in contrast to uh, uh, third order perturbation theory you use in photon echo spectroscopy here you need, need fourth order perturbation theory. So basically you have like a succession of four pauses and then you basically see your, our, our, our single. And so you get like, a, uh, like these four fields here, you get a different response function, which also occurs information about the detection time. Right, and then basically the uh, single or is, well, if, or you get in this mode when you kind of, I mean, like integrate here over the detection. Okay, you can do this uh, well and analyze this. Of course, it's all perturbation theory. You can analyze this essentially also with all uh, Feynman diagrams. I mean, this is like the generic picture of, of these different Feynman diagrams. So you have like four interactions, and then you have like at the end uh, fluorescence, which I indicated here by the red arrows. All right. Um, what you measure then, or what I'll show you now, is uh, basically for the impulsive limit and uh, the absorptive signal. So I have like the rephasing and non rephasing uh, contributions, and I have this kind of rephasing and non rephasing pathways here, which I just integrated up, integrate up, and then do a Fourier transform. All right. So uh, the whole thing has been uh, put forward for, for dimer models. So dimer model would be, as, as you see it here, you have like a model with three local electronic states, 
are like uh, ground state, first excited, second excited state, and then you have also doubly excited state. And uh, while well, you have different processes like internal conversion here, fluorescence and also relaxation. Like you might view this also in this more, uh, in these eigenstate state representations, we have like a band here for the doubly excited states and a band for the singly excited state in different processes in between. At this point, to make it simple, I would just combine these three to, to a single state uh, sigma. We also did that with all, but, but there, there's no essential difference for what I'm going to tell about. OK, so uh, then you can uh, analyze for this model, these different Feynman diagrams. I mean, I don't want to bore you. Uh, so it's basically just the previous time diagrams and just putting some labels for the uh, singly excited state and also for the double excited state and the fluorescent state, which could be like any of those uh, in this general formulation. All right. So uh, the response function, okay, then you, you all plug this in and then you get uh, essentially these response functions. One important thing is then you have to introduce some conditional probability that well, wherever you end up, uh, you will get in some time interval TD to this final emitting state. All right, so where you get this uh, probability from, okay, just imagine you describe the dynamics or the, the kinetics of your level scheme by this rate equation integrated off, you get like P, the vector of, of like populations being Green's function uh, and uh, P zero. And then you get this conditional probability for reaching the emitting state just by the matrix elements of this Green function. All right, so let's just pick one single like CP plus minus or the cross peak at plus minus. Here's what the single looks like. Let's right? see, so we integrate here over detection time. So it's integrated detection. And uh, why you get this different terms, which is just like counting all these, these diagrams. Right, so like the first part is due to a ground state bleach. And the second part is, uh, as you can see here from the matrix elements of the dipole, it's involving sigma, so it's excited state absorption. All right, so here's a rate model for this level scheme where it's essentially like have, having like non-radiative and fluorescent radiative fluorescence rates from the different um, uh, states and for well, keeping it that simple, we can essentially solve this model analytically. Why right, for this conditional probabilities? Uh, so what what about these rates? I uh, like just look at different time scales, fluorescence. Okay, maybe you're in a nanosecond range, uh, like one exciton relaxation. It's like femtosecond, picosecond. When we have seen the time scales before, what about like this uh, deactivation of this doubly excited state? Right, so then in principle, where does it come from? It's coming from exciton exciton annihilation. Right, it also has, it could have a contribution, of course, from the fluorescence, uh, but normally exciton exciton annihilation is a much um, uh, faster uh, channel. Right, exciton exciton annihilation, for those who, who don't know, basically you, you, it's at the heart of it, it's a process which is uh, due to non adiabatic interactions. So basically you have like, Two excitons here, they can fuse, uh, giving a higher local, higher excited state. And this then by internal conversion, so it's a breakdown of the born of Mama approximation, leads you back and essentially transforms one excitation to heat. Okay, here's a rate for that. I mean, it's basically the overlap between uh, uh, our different wave function coefficient, but but that's that's uh, just in case one would treat it more accurate. Here we, for us, it's just a number. Well, it should be aware of it that there's, I mean, what I told you now with this overlap, this means that this is taking place in the so-called coherence domain, right? So then you are really on the range of a few femto, hundreds femto to, to pick a second. There's also kind of diffusion driven of uh, deactivation, exciton, exciton annihilation, which is more on the pick, pick a second to nanosecond step time scale, right? But I'm talking about this shorter time scale. Because like, okay, the excitation is in one of these LH2 complexes. So what we know now, okay, well, this is then very rapid process, which is on the order of uh, the one exciton relaxation time, and therefore much uh, larger are the rates compared to the fluorescence. Okay, what can I do with that and that limit? Okay, so what happens with these different terms here? So like wherever I'm not ending up in the eventually fluorescent state minus, I can cancel out. If I look at uh, the analytical solution for this term, p sigma minus, p plus minus, 
it turns out that in this limit, they both are one over uh, gamma fluorescence. So they will all together cancel. So that means all this excited state absorption cancels here and doesn't contribute to the cross peak signal. All right, so um, uh, then uh, I can calculate the full signal. And what I see here then, okay, that's now all terms for, from, from ground state bleach. And what I see here then is, okay, I get these cross peaks. They have a, I mean, normally you would uh, address cross peaks and say, okay, well, they, they are related to the strength of the interaction or something like that. Unfortunately, that's not that easy in this case, uh, because if you look, I mean, that's here, like the different cross peaks a function is a coupling with it versus detuning. Uh, so you see, I mean, they have a kind of not obvious behavior in, in the sense that you cannot read off the, from the magnitude of the cross peak immediately the uh, coupling state. All right. So what happens in case of zero there, j equal to zero of uncoupled uh, um, a combo force. There has been some discussion, therefore I will just address this briefly. Okay, you can take this equation, take the limit. Okay, so like k plus is uh, uh, equal to zero. So it's, the states are essentially, the excitations are uh, decoupled, but uh, only you have, you have no mixing between local double excitation and two exciton states. You have deactivation by fluorescence only or uh, here. And if you take the limit, you see, okay, you only have dial peaks. So basically that's a J equal to zero limit. All right, uh, no cross peaks. Okay, one well, can, um, because there was some discussion we, we uh, recently, uh, uh, Tenu, and uh, we teamed up with uh, Thomas uh, in, in Prague and uh, uh, wrote some perspective on that. Uh, you can essentially, well, I'm, I think I'm running out of time, uh, Thomas, right? How much time I have? Yeah, so let me see. Oh, it you don't. Good if you start wrapping up going. because we otherwise there will not really be time for questions. Okay, okay. So so then uh, uh, just briefly, I mean, you can you can also have a like more simple minded view on that. So basically, to compare what would be the fluorescence from two isolated uh, chromophores and writing it once in, in this uh, representation of local state, writing this in this two particle basis, uh, where you take into account that you have, in a way, conditional probabilities that one chromophore is emitting while the other not, and you have it like for each chromophore, and then you have also like two photons coming out uh, from the emission of this double excited state. The two signals from here and here, and it's just a different core mechanical representation, so it should be equal. And if you analyze this now, then you say, okay, well, uh, here A1 and A2, so it's at this frequency, that red frequency here should give only a, uh, uh, a diagonal peak. Uh, if you, so like the second representation should also only give a diagonal peak. If you analyze this diagrams contributing to this different process, so you see, well, I mean, like you have here, uh, at this process, you have a minus, when you have only one incoming error, so you have like a minus sign. Here you have a plus sign. This uh, comes out twice, two photons. So the two will just cancel each other if you want. That's like a simple-minded view or a very simple, straightforward to understand view on this process to, to understand why there are no cross peaks if you have no coupling. Okay, anyway, so I'm, 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 I'm at the end. Just want to, to sum up. Uh, I uh, uh, talked about like in the, in the uh, main part with this uh, free, uh, fluorescence detected uh, spectroscopy uh, that there's uh, an issue about the cross peaks which give you information uh, about, I mean, if they are there and uh, you are time zero, they give you information about uh, the initial excitation. You can drive this even further. I mean, what, what you see here in this graph there was a theme of that paper is essentially what happens um, immediately at the, well, if you want, the, this first the picture is just like, I mean, you already did this time scale uh, separation. Right? You can think of it, if you, if, if you have some transfer, you have some coupling, and therefore you have also some wave function delocalization. Right? So, but this fact is kind of destroyed later on due to uh, like decoherence. But uh, I like the, I mean, if you want, you can see it in a way that the photon, what it senses, of course, the eigenstates, right? So it, it senses this, at the moment of excitation, this delocalization, 
and therefore you see kind of this 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 cross peak here this this point i think that's i mean at least for me that was was the uh, most important uh, uh, issue of of this uh, um, investigation all right of course there are plenty of things to do but uh, time is up so i just want to thank marco which is up here Xiao Meng, who did this Vinosium calculation, who's here. Eterno Donatas uh, Mohamed, who oh, is not on that, this graph, uh, who uh, did this uh, um, MCDX calculation, which was supported by Hans Meyer. And of course, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. So the uh, talk is open for questions. Uh, please just um, raise your hand and we will pr promote you to the panel uh, for asking the question. So maybe while other people are thinking about it. Oh, I see Pavel have a question. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I would have yeah. Su been surprised if you don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I just want to ask, uh, so you uh, put a lot of uh, weight on this spectra at, uh, at time zero. And uh, it is true that you don't have any coherent artifact in this fluorescence detected uh, spectroscopy, but uh, you still have um, effects like uh, pulse overlap, right? Are you confident to do the simulations in the impulsive limit? Okay, well, I mean, if you're asking me right, like that, that you probably have done this yourself and, and seen some some effects, right? So, uh, okay, now I mean, I, we, we we didn't look at it, but but you you are right. I mean, like this this is in a way that that's an idealized uh, situation where where you of course you have to convolute it somehow with the field, and then it will be. I mean, it's not perfectly what I'm saying. I mean, I just was discussing like the ideal case, right? So. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, what I'm getting at right is, I mean, in this paper, you were like, uh, now, for example, discussing, then uh, you go more deeper into this, uh, into the double quantum coherence signals and so on. And uh, yeah, at around, uh, around uh, time zero, when you had no time ordering, then it's difficult to distinguish who is, for example, double quantum coherence and non rephasing and so on, right? So, yeah, just, uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, okay. So now this, this uh, I mean, okay, well. Uh, yeah, so we, we only did this so far in this in this. Uh, okay, but it would be possible, for example, for you to calculate with uh, with five. Sure, it would be possible, yeah, but but it's I mean, uh, just no time and, and uh, yeah. Uh, manpower. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So. Yeah, Maxim. Uh, just a follow up, Oliver, but uh, could you please tell? Uh, briefly, how you would be doing that? I mean, including the final, uh, the final pulse duration, the calculations, because, well, uh, typically, if we are talking about something like the chi 3 approximation, right, so it involves ER, well, uh, triple integral over their uh, fields. Uh, mm -hmm. And typically, uh, well, this, this takes some, some time, okay, let me, let me put this way. Yeah, okay, this this won't be more 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 easy here, but but probably I would ra rather do it the other way that I I'm like uh, uh, not doing this perturbation theory, but but really uh, explicitly solve a set of equations which have this this kind of phase information encoded. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yes. I see. Like, like the, the way it's shown here, I mean, agreeably that that will be a nightmare to to do it numerically. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Thomas. I think that I interrupted you. No, it's perfectly fine. So, uh, since uh, uh, maybe I can ask a question. So, um, have you considered what would happen to your calculated spectra if you would uh, prohibit the annihilation of the uh, excitons? Yes, or they, if the the uh, um, doubly these doubly excited states would not be uh, having the possibility of making the uh, internal conversion. What would the effect be on the spectra? Uh, okay, well, this put, put it like this. I mean, this has to be done. Okay, we, we do. I mean, okay, so so what? what oops. Okay, uh, what, what what you're suggesting is basically to do this type of calculation for the full model, and put this KIC equal to zero. Right or exactly. Well, in a way, okay. So we, we we didn't do this because this, I mean, like KI, I mean, this internal conversion or or or, or is, is like a very prominent 
the fact, right? I mean, you can, of course, in that model, you could kind of introduce, um, okay, what, what you could do is basically you kind of uh, uh, also put this KIC, put this, I mean, like shift these, these levels or and so on. Okay, so one could think of uh, different ways of interrupt, uh, inter inter uh, interrupting this pathway, but, but my, although I, I wrote uh, here that's like F, F is, is certainly not the second excited state, right? So you have, at this point, you have a lot, already lots of uh, like uh, uh, states which, which will act as, as an effective channel. So, I mean, in a, in a way, the situation looked too unrealistic to me that, that I, I, I considered this. So I cannot, I cannot really answer that question. Okay. Uh, Thomas, uh, then, then maybe I have, I have a question to you because this also echoes some discussion that we had in the past. But if you, if you suggest that there is a non-radiative relaxation path uh, doesn't exist, okay, then you should somehow include the radiative relaxation path, right? That would be quite reasonable. Yeah, okay, well, wait a minute, I can, can answer this. So, so uh, okay, well, I should probably correct it. I mean, like if, if you put KIC equal to zero, then of course you should have also a red arrow pointing down here, right? Because uh, that will be then, uh, I mean, I just didn't do this because normally KIC is much larger than, than in gamma fluorescence. Right? So, 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 so in the way, I mean, like if you put this equal to zero, you, you uh, mm, well, okay, no, we, we didn't do this, so I don't want to say. <laughs> I, I think the has a, uh, either a comment or a question. You should recover the original 2D spectrum, no? Like standard, something's very similar to the coherent 2D spectrum. We have done this at least uh, theoretically. Uh, yeah, because yeah exactly so that, that's comment. exactly what I would think. So Donatas, yes. you wanted to say something? Yeah, it was exactly my comment. Okay. Yeah. If you ignore the pulse overlap effects, of course. Yeah, yeah precisely, yeah. Of course, yeah. Then I think we agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, Any other questions? Not as I didn't uh, see that uh, that you are here. Right? So uh, you you already gave your talk, or, or it's later, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, two, two weeks. weeks from now. Okay. So then, <laughs> uh, okay. Maybe then you can can fill in the gaps I, I left with your, with your experiments. Yeah. So I joined later. I, I, I was in another. Oh, okay. Uh, so Oliver, you can come and ask Donatas the questions as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I could I could answer them, but 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 uh, well, he will be of course the better person to discuss his experiment. Right? Okay. Well, in a way, I was just like happy that some of the things we we discussed many years ago kind of also show up in these very uh, recent experiments. Right? Okay. Any final question? Otherwise, I think we should say. Um... Thank you to uh, Oliver and um, let me